Uh, so this next talk is from uh, Megan El Chikali and Saad Khan, who are both members of the Slavov Lab. Uh, Megan recently competed, uh, completed her PhD in statistics from UC Santa Barbara and has been working and collaborating with our group for a long time and is now a postdoc in our lab. Uh, and she's done a really great job of bringing a sound knowledge of Bayesian inference and statistics to the lab and kind of getting us all on side and um, really doing a great job of disseminating that knowledge and, and bringing creative analysis to the lab. And uh, Saad Khan um did his undergrad studies in Dubai and completed his master's in work in, in England uh, and also worked on deep mutational scanning in, in uh, Beijing for a while and has really been the glue that's held our lab together and additional uh, doing a lot of creative analysis and acquiring a really awesome data set that you guys are going to learn about shortly. Uh, so without further ado. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Saad, and that's Megan. Thank you so much for being here. We're very excited to tell you about our work. Um, and so as with most research, we start off with a question. And our question here is, how much of the variation in protein abundance is not explained by that of its corresponding transcript? Now, obviously, we, we have our question, but we need something uh, like a measurement, a quantity. And so what we use to sort of evaluate this question is we're looking at the relative protein to mRNA ratio. Uh, and of course, denotation and connotation are important. So the first thing that I'd like to sort of point out is when we say post-transcriptional regulation, what we specifically mean is all regulation that happens after transcription. Uh, we interpret this, of course, in the framework of what we're doing and in our data as a difference in the rate of protein synthesis and degradation. Great. So if we can do this well, what can we hope to gain? Well, we can hope to better interrogate the dynamics of biological systems by understanding the state variables that influence this concordance or discordance or whatever is going on. So cool. So we have our motivations. Uh, and now I want to give you a little bit of background. I want to motivate where we're coming from and give you a bit of a short story. So in 2018, uh, this guy, this smiling, happy guy over here, uh, and some of his happy, smiling colleagues over here released a paper. Uh, they did some single cell protein analysis. I don't know. They did some something of that nature in their paper, Scope MS. It's a very cool paper. Uh, of course, changed a lot. Uh, and they did very cool analysis. And I would specifically like to motivate what we're doing with this. Now, this is the last figure, last panel, last figure of that paper. And that on, on the right is actually the last sentence of the paper, or as I think of it, the famous last sentence. So what we see in this figure, essentially, we're looking at the concordance between mRNA and protein covariation. And the point that the authors were making uh, was in their system, uh, which was embryonic stem cells, um, the more sort of, I, I don't want to say housekeeping, but the more functional things tied to the general upkeep of the cell's work tend to correlate quite well at the mRNA and protein level, whereas those that are specific to its cell type, to its function, to what it does, tend to not correlate so well. And this can indeed be inferred as post-transcriptional regulation. But the authors were very forthright, and they said that, look, this difference could be post-transcriptional regulation. It could also just be noise. Um, and they're right. Uh, of course, this figure didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, the year before, another happy, smiling face, Professor Alex Franks over here, who's Megan's PhD supervisor, and that same seated, smiling guy did a paper uh, looking at post-transcriptional regulation across human tissues. And indeed, in this study, of course, it was a bulk study, and they took data that existed already. And even here, they, they, they looked at the reliability or, or the degree of noise. But they said, look, there are systematic biases in sample collection and handling. And so it's tough for us to, again, be like, OK, we can say that this regulation is happening or that's happening. So that's kind of the backdrop. Um, and so here we are for round three equipped with all the techniques that we've developed in the Slavov lab, plus, of course, the wisdom and experience of Professor Slavov and Professor Franks, Megan on the team. So we take a crack at it again, essentially, and see if we can answer that question, if we can get to this answer. So for our study, uh, we had a very interesting, very relevant sample, which was primary human testes samples. Uh, now, alongside the brain, uh, the human testes have been denoted to have the highest degree of discordance in mRNA and protein levels. Uh, and aside of just that, they're just a very interesting, very cool cell type. You know, there's regulatory cells, there's a dynamic trajectory. We go from stem cells, the spermatogonia, to spermatocytes, to spermatids. We stop translating, we stockpile mRNA. They're just a very interesting subject to, to look at. 
So we have our team, we have our cell type. We start collecting data. We do proteomics. We're proteomicists, as I like to say. Uh, and of course, we know what we're looking for. So we used all the techniques that we have in our lab. Uh, and we collected data. So we use scope two style preps, which were DDA acquisition using a carrier, MS2 quant with TMT. We did prioritize scope prep. So we changed the acquisition scheme a little bit, but it's still the same setup. And then of course we get orthogonal data, which is FlexDIA, which is three cells, no carrier, MS1 quant, DIA done on a Timstoff SCP. Forgot to mention all the previous ones were done on a good old Q Exactive Classic. Um, and so why did we do this? Well, we wanted to get these separate estimates for the abundance of a protein or a peptide, right? And more importantly, we wanted to get an estimate for the reliability of our measurements. We wanted to see if we can see this noise and characterize it and work with it. So we have our protein data. Of course, we have no shortage of existing mRNA data, single cell RNA-seq data. That said, for the testes, actually, we were let down because there actually weren't that many data sets that could satisfy what we were hoping to do. Uh, but anyways, we get our mRNA data. Um, we couldn't find any plate-based alternative online preps that had been done, like data sets that existed. So unfortunately, we took 10x and drop seq. There are biases that are shared, but you know, they're still, the primers are different, the setup is slightly different, and the tech is a bit different. Good enough. So we have our two data sets. Now, our next step is we need to make sure that we're measuring the same thing, right? So we say, OK, there's this discordance between mRNA and protein, but are you measuring the same thing? So we need to align ourselves, right? Um, and for our alignment, we chose to use LIGER, which is which implements iterative non-negative matrix factorization. And the cool thing about that is that this considers both sources of shared and unshared variation uh, across the modalities that we use. A very important thing I forgot to mention is that for this particular iteration, we decided to do everything at the cluster level. There are multiple reasons for this, uh, but the two big ones that come to mind is for the kind of inference we had planned um, at the single cell level is very computationally challenging, and also matching our cells uh, to each other becomes a task as well. So we perform the inference at the cluster level. Uh, we have to be very careful about the fact that we have modality specific and cross modality technical factors, and we have to account for the expected impact of post transcriptional regulation. And so what do we do to select our feature space for this alignment? Um, we basically compute correlations across the two modalities specific correlation matrices, and we select the most highly correlated gene products uh, that we sort of find. So kind of similar to that first analysis, that first plot that I was showing you. So we have our feature space that we expect will give us things that are not post transcriptionally regulated and also obviates the issue of dealing with the different sets of noise and so on and so forth. So we have our features and we go ahead and align our data sets. So We've aligned our data, um, and in blue, we have our proteins. So we have 5,883 protein cells. And in pink, we have mRNA, because Megan, mRNA is a she. Uh, so this is our data. We have our data together. Uh, and now what we must do for two reasons, not just because classically everyone thinks, oh, it's just label transfer. So not just for label transfer, we want to have cross-modality uh, clusters. We want to co-cluster the data. So we do, we do Luvan clustering. And then for each of those clusters, we're able to transfer the cell type from the labeled mRNA data that was you know, clustered independently and expertly labeled by people who work with testy samples. And we transfer the cell type to each of these clusters. And eventually we have our joint sort of clusters. For our analysis, we only considered these six cell types, which is the endothelial cells, Leydig cells, and the peritubular myoid cells as well as, of course, the differentiating spermatogonia, spermatocytes, and spermatids. So we have our alignment, we have our cell types, but we want to get some confidence. We want to be sure we're doing this well. And so we had many, 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 many metrics for how to be confident in this alignment. But I'm just going to show you two that are, that are quite relevant and quite interpretable. So here, this is very simply, uh, in the feature space that we use for the alignment, we compute basically correlations for the gene products across both modalities. Uh, and so we expect the diagonal to be you know, red or as red as we can get it. And this looks pretty good for our cell types and for our system. Uh, and because we are, so now going back to the label transfer, because we are doing the label transfer, we also wanted to compute uh, or get a degree of basically uh, cluster compactness for the proteomic only data. 
And so we computed these distance ratios, which essentially compares the median Mahalanobis distance within a cluster to that across the separate clusters. If things are not looking good, then our cluster of choice is the same as all the other clusters, and we're going to get a value close to one. And you can see here that basically this blue was where we started, and we're pretty close to one. And the red is where we finished, and we're quite far away from one. So we're quite happy here. And now we basically have the platform that we can use to now think about uncertainty and get reliability. And Megan is going to talk to you about all that stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so now we can build a little intuition behind how we quantify post transcriptional uh, regulation. And um, we are going to do this on the, I don't know if people could hear me. Is this good? Okay. Uh, we're going to do this on the log two scale. So PGC is the average log two protein, uh, relative protein intensity for protein G and cell type C. And this is relative to the average across uh, cell types in protein G. And so PGC is MGC, the log two relative transcript abundance, um, plus the log two relative protein to mRNA ratio or RPTR, which we could see as that RGC term there in purple. And so this is the term that gives us the opportunity to quantify post-transcriptional regulation. There you go. Because if a gene is regulated mostly transcriptionally, um, then the amount of mRNA that's transcribed will be similar to the relative amount of protein that's synthesized, and so R will be close to zero. But if a gene is regulated mostly post-transcriptionally, then R will be extreme or have high variability across cell types. Another way that we can explore post-transcriptional regulation is by correlating mRNA and protein across cell types. Because again, if a gene is regulated mostly transcriptionally, this R will be close to zero, so that correlation will be high. So to summarize, we want to quantify the effect of post-transcriptional regulation in individual proteins. And we are going to do that by estimating the log two relative protein to mRNA ratio. Okay, great. Um, so now we know what the RPTR is, but why can't we just use the observed mRNA and protein to compute empirical ratios and quantify post-transcriptional regulation? Um, this is because of some important statistical challenges, specifically with respect to the effect of random noise and technical variation. And this includes missing data, noisy measurements, and technical biases like batch. So if we were to just compute the empirical ratios, we would end up with ratios that are biased as a result of some of these technical effects. And if we were to just correlate mRNA and protein, uh, then the high noise would result in correlation attenuation, where the mRNA protein correlation appears lower than it really is. And just in general, differences that we would potentially attribute to biological causes would actually be a result of these, this noise and technical effects. So to get around these statistical challenges in this project, we are going to integrate data from multiple sources into one Bayesian model um, that reflects the measurement process and captures the log two relative protein to mRNA ratio. Great. So now as we discussed, um, the effect of variation contributed by technical sources and noise has a really big impact on quantifying post-transcriptional regulation. So understanding the influence of these technical factors on our data is really important. And one way that we can understand that is by exploring reliability, which really is the total amount of variability that we observe that is accounted for by biological sources. And we have a few different metrics we can use um, to understand reliability. And the first one that we'll discuss is protein consistency. And this gives a view of reliability at the protein level within a given data set. And we can compute protein consistency for proteins with at least two peptides quantified. And to do this, we randomly separate the peptides associated with each protein into two groups and compute the average across peptides in each group. And we do this for each cell type. Um, and then we can compute the correlation across cell types um, for those averages. And the other reliability metric that we will discuss is data set agreement. And this one gives us a sense of reliability for proteins across data sets or across measurement techniques. 
And as opposed to protein consistency, which we need two or more peptides quantified to be able to use, um, data set agreement can be applied to both modalities as long as uh, it's observed in at least two data sets. And so here we can see an example of data set agreement um, for two different proteins. We have one protein at the top there, TPI1, and this one has high data set agreement. And you can see that because the lines um, which represent the, the uh, data sets associated with each modality are close to one another. And then also um, in the lower panel, you can see a low data set agreement protein, ALDOC. And there's a lot more noise affecting data sets um, for each of our modalities for this protein. And so this protein reflects a larger degree of technical variability and is therefore measured with less reliability than the above one that we saw there. And there's something that's interesting about this pair of proteins, and that is that our two reliability metrics actually agree with each other. And so by that, I mean that the high data set agreement protein actually also has high protein consistency or high agreement across peptides. Um, and the low data set agreement protein also has low protein consistency as well. So now let's go ahead and explore this relationship between our two reliability metrics across all of our gene products. So here we can take a look at data set consistency and, I mean, excuse me, data set agreement and protein consistency a little more closely. Um, on the x-axis, we have the rank of the protein consistency, and on the y-axis, we have data set agreement. Um, and there, this is shown for the mRNA data in, um, in pink and the protein data, both across measurement techniques in blue. And then um, we can also see the across modalities agreement there in purple as well. And there's a lot of big takeaways for this uh, plot. First of all, uh, we have a positive correlation between, as mentioned, between our two reliability metrics. And this gives us a sense that we have a really clear view of variability contributed by technical factors for each of our proteins measured. Because again, we are uh, measuring reliability with these two metrics and they agree with each other. Another big takeaway is that the uh, data set agreement is much higher within a modality than between modalities. So this indicates to us, at least for most of the gene products, the low correlation between mRNA and protein is not only explained by technical variation. Um, otherwise, we would see the across modalities data set agreement somewhere between the blue and the red. And so there's biological variability of interest here between our two modalities that we're going to want to explore further. All right. So now we understand some of that background well enough to get into Bayesian models and how they work. Okay, let's start just on really general terms about Bayes' theorem and Bayesian analysis. Many of you are probably familiar with frequentist statistics and parametrized modeling where we're associating some kind of likelihood function with our data. So we're saying, okay, our data is normal or Poisson or whatever. And in this case with Bayesian statistics, um, we still have that but also we use something called Bayes' theorem. And Bayes' theorem tells us that if we multiply that likelihood function by something called a prior distribution, um, then we end up with a posterior distribution up to some normalizing constant. And this prior represents some kind of prior expectation um, that we're holding for our data. So in our case, for example, um, since we aren't assuming post-transcriptional regulation in advance, our prior for our PTR is centered at zero. Um, and this posterior distribution represents kind of an updated probability density function given the data that we've actually observed. And Bayesian statistical analysis is all about doing this. And one really major benefit is that where with frequentist statistics, we end up with one point estimate um, for our parameters of interest. With Bayesian statistics, we can sample from this estimated posterior distribution. We can collect as many samples as we want, and then we can use those samples to figure out whatever we want about our parameters of interest. Um, now that we've established that background, let's get into our model a little more specifically. Um, we've been discussing reliability and technical variation, and we know that that's really important. And so with our model base PG, we can disentangle these biological and technical sources of variability so that we can estimate the log two relative protein to mRNA ratio, or that RPTR. In order to build reliability measurement into our model, um, we use a protein level sampling variability that reflects the protein consistency or the agreement across peptides because we're modeling peptide level averages. 
the cluster level. Um, but also the fact that we're jointly modeling data from all of these data sets as replicates, we are able to account for data set agreement as well. Additionally, we account for technical biases um, using normalization parameters for each data set at the gene product and cluster levels. And then the last important component that we should discuss is scaling and ratio compression. Um, since mRNA and protein aren't quantified on the same scale, and this can vary even protein to protein or by the data set collection protocol that we're using, um, we use an, a scaling parameter that's independent for each protein and measurement technique. Um, and as a result of this model structure, we are able to draw samples from the estimated posterior distribution for consensus protein, mRNA, and of course our RPTR term there. To fit this model, we use um, STAN on the cluster level values, and this uses no U-turn sampling, which is an extension of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo um, to give us posterior samples for all of our parameters. All right. So here with this blurry figure, we can illustrate a little bit more of what this actually looks like, as well as the concept of detecting post-transcriptional regulation. Um, so here we can see our cluster level observed data for each of our modalities, and we put that into our model. And then um, we end up with a bunch of posterior samples for each of our gene products and for each cell type. And so for this example, we're showing Leydig cells and we can see the consensus protein and mRNA distributions for these three gene products and, or three pairs of gene products. And then based on the differences of those two, we can get the posterior intervals for RPTR, which you could see beneath the consensus distributions. And so here you could see the 95% posterior intervals um, for RPTR, which we'll get into a little bit more soon about how those are made. Um, but first, basically, based on the share of biological and technical variability, um, these posterior intervals have different widths. And this affects whether or not we're able to detect extreme RPTR. Um, so for this first example here, we have more over here, uh, we have more narrow posterior intervals. And so this results in a narrow posterior interval for RPTR, and we can detect post-transcriptional regulation. Um, but then in this second example in the middle there, the consensus distribution intervals are quite wide. And so then RPTR has a wide distribution as well, and we aren't able to detect post-transcriptional regulation. Okay, so we built this complex model, but why should we have any confidence in it? And how do we know that this model is doing a good job reflecting reality? Um, we can examine this using something called posterior predictive checks. And with posterior predictive checking, we can simulate observations um, under this model that we're proposing. And then we can use statistics to compare those simulated observations to our real ones and identify whether or not our model makes sense. So here we can see a summary of those posterior predictive statistics. This includes the posterior predictive fold changes and variance as well over here. We can see that we're accomplishing high coverage. And then also we could see the posterior predictive correlations of, of mRNA and protein fold changes across cell types. And in the black line, we can see the observed. And so we can see that our model is doing a pretty good job at reflecting our observations, or in other words, our model is realistic and capturing our observed quantifications well. All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about our 95% um, posterior intervals and testing of GO groups. So as I mentioned, we compute 95% posterior intervals on the protein to mRNA ratio to identify proteins with statistically significant non-zero RPTR. And here we can see a little summary of those gene level test results. Um, for this protein shown here, calreticulin, we can see our 95% posterior intervals for RPTR. And then below it, we can also see the Z-transformed cluster level fold changes. And so we can see that for the cell types that are determined to have significant RPTR or non-zero RPTR for this um, protein, they're the ones that they generally have um, more agreement with across data sets within a modality, but then more disagreement between the two modalities. And we can see a summary as well for the results for all of our gene products um, tested in the model. And the ones determined to be statistically significant are shown there in the purple. 
And um, we can see the total number of significant gene products for each of our cell types and just over 1,000 uh, gene products where we have significant non-zero RPTR. And so we can see as well cow reticulin, the protein that we saw here, um, as the green circle. And so now uh, we can discuss testing at the Go level, which we also do using the average across genes associated with each Go group for each cell type. And so here we can see some results for that Go testing. We have um, a heat map showing the group level average of the posterior mean of RPTR um, for each cell type and for select significant groups. And there's some interesting groups here um, related to spermatogenesis and regulation as well, like pentose biosynthetic processes and sperm flagellum. And we can also see um, for each of those groups shown the posterior means of the gene level RPTR, specifically in the spermatids, and um, as well the uh, bu -bu -bu false discovery rate or the Bayesian analog to the false discovery rate and the distribution of the posterior mean of RPTR across all genes as well at the top. And so now I will pass it back to Saad and get a little more into the biological processes potentially affected. Yeah, so we're just gonna ping pong a little bit. So essentially, I, I think we have our model, we're satisfied, we're happy with it, and we have our outputs. Uh, but it'd be interesting to go back and see if we can accomplish our eventual goal. And, you know, the spermatids, as, as we know, and as I said earlier, I alluded to, are a very, very, very dynamic cell type. There's a lot going on. Um, and we can see that reflected in the terms where we see that are specific to the cell type that show a high degree of post-transcriptional regulation. So we know that for the spermatids, there's massive mitochondrial uh, remodeling. They're broken down. They're moved around. Uh, and we can see that in the highly negative RPTR that we see for the respiratory chain complex. And now, of course, if that's not working, you still need to produce, your cell still needs to function. And so you see there, as Megan alluded to, the pentose biosynthetic process uh, working. Um, now, as the spermatids go to the sperm, you obviously have to really, really condense your, your, your DNA, your chromatin. And so you see acetylation uh, happening, lots of it. And what happens is essentially, essentially, uh, the histones are acetylated and their grasp on your DNA chromatin becomes looser. That's how it works. And then they are easier to remove. So you remove them and they're replaced with these molecules called protamines that are able to very tightly bind the DNA and get this very, very compressed uh, chromatin structure. As I said, you know, there's, there's stockpiling. And so, and, and later there's a huge jump in uh, translation. And so indeed, there's going to be lots and lots of tRNA splicing to ensure that when we reach that point, we can fly and do what we need to do. So essentially the point is, and what I'm saying is, all these terms that are very specific to that cell type seem to be post-transcriptionally regulated. That's cool, that's great, but I, for one, am not particularly satisfied just looking at this. I want closure. And so what we can do now is we can make that figure again. We can look at it. Uh, we have our model output, and awesomely, we see the same thing here. We have our small ribosome, large ribosome. Uh, of course, the difference is that um, these are computed using our posterior samples and correlation across each iteration, and then we compute this. So it's computed differently, but it's essentially the same message, and, and, and we're seeing the exact same thing. And if one wanted to, which I will not, uh, they could even look at this and say how much of the variation in proteins abundance is explained by transcript abundance. Uh, and so I think this is where I'll end off on this lovely note here um, and just talk about horizons. You know, Obviously, using mass spectrometry, we can get more informative measurements towards how we interpret the differences in protein and mRNA. Uh, we can add in model covariates, for example, different conditions, age, et cetera. Of course, oh, sorry. Of course, doing this at the single cell level and more biological interpretation towards what we're seeing and what that means and, and so on and so forth. And yeah, finally, of course, I'd love to thank our funders and this wonderful group. Andrew, I forgot to thank you for your lovely intro. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, all these people who were directly involved in the project, but also not directly involved, but just made every day a, a delight, essentially. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's our talk and uh, happy to take any questions. Questions?
really, really cool talk and very cool work um, that's applicable in very many areas. My question was, um, so you mentioned that the high abundant proteins tended to correlate very well at the both the mRNA and protein level. Do you see a general trend like as you go down the dynamic range to low abundance proteins um, where you see poor correlation and would is that um, mostly attributed to like technological um, challenges or more post-transcriptional regulation? And then um, to take this model a bit further, can you also predict like protein degradation? Oh, um, do you want to take protein degradation? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so, so certainly we do see better correlation with things that are more abundant across the mRNAs. Uh, there's many reasons to, to think about this. I mean, things that are potentially lowly abundant aren't quite as highly expressed aren't expressed in specific um, contexts. And so you're not going to see that uh, correlation. And what was, sorry, what was the second part of your question? Can, can I what? Can you, use the, uh, can you use it to apply to identify protein degradation? Uh, we can certainly infer that with the results that we have here. But I think I would be hard pressed to very specifically say that, oh, yeah, it's definitely degradation. But I mean, if you have a ratio and you're looking at it and you're seeing this you know, imbalance, there's likely only a couple of real reasons that you would be seeing that. But again, I would I would steer clear of um, very specifically and, and actively saying that, but I can say likely that's the case. So, you know, this more informative measurements will be able to get us to answer your exact question. And that that is on the horizon. Um, thank you for the talk. I had a couple questions about the uh, Bayesian methods. Um, it's kind of technical. Um, First of all, how many parameters did you end up estimating in the Bayesian model? And also, how long did the MCMC end up taking to estimate the posterior? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so a lot of parameters. Um, so I guess just looking at things the, at the mean levels, we have the, the gene product level sampling variability. And so there's, you know, however many gene products, I think almost 4,000 that are put into the model. Um, so 4,000 just for those. And then the same for the scaling parameter as well, which then double that as well, based on the flex CIA and P scope based measurement technique. And then at the mean level, um, there is the kind of biology type terms like mRNA and, and RPTR. But then also there's all of the technical variability or technical bias terms at the cluster level, gene product level for each data set. So I've lost count now, but you know, definitely in the order of thousands. And then um, as far as how long it took to run a long time, I use command stand if you're familiar. And so that was able to speed things up quite a bit as opposed to R stand, for example. Um, and so yeah, just on your typical out of the box number of sample iterations, I mean, I would get done with my whole pipeline of running the model, computing posterior predictive, uh, checks which within command stand happens, you could do the draw separately. Um, and you know, whatever, generating the plots and stuff 24 hours, I would say, for like everything. Um, so yeah, quite, quite, quite a long time, and uh, definitely a, a complex posterior geometry to explore. But, yeah, thank you for asking. <laughs> Really cool talk. Thank you very much. And also really well done for looking into regulated noise uh, versus technical uh, noise. Before I ask my question, I have one question back in terms of um, what you consider post-transcriptional regulation. So would you consider splicing as part of post-transcriptional regulation or not? Because that's called transcriptional. Um, yeah. So, so like I said, we would consider essentially everything that happens after transcription to be that. But we're not actually specifically looking at splicing that happens. We didn't evaluate that specifically in our work here. And so we really just in, in, interpret it as degradation and synthesis-related differences. Uh, but I'm with you for post-transcriptional regulation, obviously, and that's why I made the clarification yeah, yeah. that, yeah, you would think of capping, so splicing. You consider, if you don't consider it post-transcriptional, for example, yeah. uh, my question is, how are you able to control for any changes in splicing that wouldn't change your mRNA abundance, but would change 
the distribution of the different isoforms, which you cannot pick up with the drop seek and the 10x because that is 3.5, bias, so you can't evaluate splicing. So I'm just curious whether that has any shape or form in pointing. Yes, it, it absolutely. It certainly is. Uh, and and again, we're we're with you on this. So we we ourselves try to generate some full length data. Um, we had a disastrous experience with Azenta. It was horrible, but. Um, that's in the pipeline. We're trying to generate it. But for this particular work, um, we didn't essentially consider the proteoforms and stuff like that um, to be separate entities. We kind of collapsed them all together and then went from went from there. OK, that's cool. Yeah. I'm just uh, really interested in that because in your final plot, your R is actually quite high for splicosome as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is measured by the, so so I'm with, again, so like I had, uh, oh, we don't have the appendices. We got rid of them. Bummer. Okay, so I had a plot appendix. I can show you after. So, so it's 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 there. It's present, and and we look at it on the complex level. So we're looking at the proteins that are part of the spliceosome, and so we see different um, parts of the process that are regulated. Some are regulated with high protein levels, and some with low pro like low protein levels. Well, more mRNA. Um, and so, yeah, the spliceosome is there for that particular reason for the complexes that essentially are forming uh, and doing the work of chopping things up. Um, if you had different proteoforms, maybe you'd have peptides potentially with lower correlation, so maybe more likely to induce a false negative. Yeah, than... yeah, we we certainly, and I think in in the write up, we we certainly reference the fact that we're um, overestimating. Yeah. Cool. Water. Nice work. Um, I was wondering if you guys. Uh, looked into any patterns in the uh, technically noisy uh, analytes that you found. Uh, sorry. If there were any patterns in the technical noise that you found, like was there any sort of characteristics of the proteins or the mRNAs that you really couldn't distinguish the technical from biological noise, which could be useful for you know future uh, studies? Patterns in the biological meaning with the high variability. No, no, patterns in the technical noise. Like what, if you were to characterize all the proteins and all the mRNAs that had high technical noise, yeah. what would you, how would you characterize them? Was it just because they they were at low abundance? That's why you had high technical noise? Or were there some other characteristics about So, them? So primarily, given how we set our study up, uh, most of them were that way. Uh, and the reason, of course, being that by using an orthogonal measurement, uh, so by using plex TIA measurements, we obviate things like uh, PIF and you know co-isolation and stuff like that, that often you suffer for the ratios from TMT. Um, and Aside of that, yeah, I think low abundance, and especially for the mRNA data, you know, we start with whatever they love to twenty five thousand transcripts, and and you know when you actually look through the data, most of it is blank, right? Um, so so yeah, low abundance. Uh, but to be very honest, we haven't like fully spent a lot of time really pulling apart this this this. Uh, sort of the, the sources of technical noise that we actually are able to quantify. Um, others, so for example, Andrew has done some work to look at potential LC-based biases that we might pick up and how we might correct for them. Uh, but in this particular body of work, we didn't um, spend too much time doing that. Add on as well, I would say that, um, I mean, this is more just, I don't, I don't have like a biological pattern to explain with respect to the technical variability, but I would say that um, in general, high across cell type variability proteins um, it, 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 there was an easier time parsing the or separating out the biological and technical variability as uh, opposed to low variability proteins. And then as well um, on the like scaling parameter technical effects, that was largely impacted by um, data collection protocol where we saw that with the um, flex DIA based uh, data, we were experiencing less ratio compression, I think, which is generally expected with that technology as opposed to the, the P-scope um, based data. And so that was another you know, interesting thing. So generally the, the uh, posterior means for the scale parameters there were less extreme. Uh, just just the, another uh, technical question. You may actually already have mentioned something related to this, but do you know whether with your proteomics um, you will have a degree against certain yeah. subcellular yeah. organelles in terms of extraction efficiency, yeah. because of course, take something like receptors, yeah. um, they will be easier to pick up uh, mm -hmm. the level of the transcriptome, I imagine. But yeah. it, do you know if that's 
biasing in any shape or form the uh so yeah so so what i can say is certainly we do uh, and a lot of the terms and a lot of the complexes that i look at are in fact for receptors but this is very dependent on as you said where they are uh in initial work where we sort of like that andrew did for example for for actually benchmarking npop um we see that in general the biases that we have towards extraction of proteins uh is quite similar to most conventional methods that we use but i will be the first to say that yeah there are biases and so for example that's why a lot of people for example, Simon, who's here somewhere, um, his group and, and and a lot of other groups work on actually like specifically extracting things better from membranes and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, there will be there will be biases, and I think it's important to to you know it's nice to make leaps and do cool things, but it's very important to also be aware of where you are limited and where and what you can and cannot infer. And that's why I think in a lot of the stuff that I'm saying, I'm quite like cagey because I don't want to just say, yeah, because this is my tendency. This is what I do too, right? I'm practiced as a biologist myself. Um, and, you know, oftentimes he has to kind of, well, he doesn't, but, you know, he kind of with his silence to some extent has to get me to just, because I'm immediately like, oh, it could be this, it could be that, that's happening, that's happening. So, yeah, I think we need to be very um, careful and, and aware. Uh, and there are certainly some biases. Thank you. A very interesting talk. I have a question uh, for the um, proteins that have like a very high in constant of protein and MI level. Um, have you checked uh, the function of those proteins and also have you checked those proteins have short or longer turnover time compared to others? Yeah, so so just just so that I'm I'm sure that I'm clear, you're asking if we saw the ones that have high concordance, right? That that agree very well. That have high PTR. Oh, that have high PTR. Okay. Um so we certainly don't um have any data about their turnover. Uh as I said, we, you know more informative measurements, hopefully someday we will. Um, but um, aside of that, functionally, yeah, there are, you know, so, so that's kind of what I was pointing out in this slide here, you know, in as a broad function, what they tend to do is like things that are very specific to that cell types functionality. So here, you know, um, tRNA splicing, histone ac acetylation essentially. Um, but I tried to do this analysis and I was super excited about it where I basically tried to go up the Go hierarchy and see if I could like pick specific directions and patterns off like post-transcription regulation for gene products uh, to go towards where you're going. Um, I haven't really gotten it to where I'd like it to be. Uh, and so I guess TBD on that one. <laughs> yeah. I actually have a similar question, but for a different uh, aspect. So I was wondering for those that have a, a difference between the mRNA levels and proteins for those proteins, is it possible that uh, that difference is uh, actually not accounted by, I don't know, the 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 turnover or degradation, but like the PTMs, like maybe certain uh, proteins have like certain PTMs and I know you're doing bottom up proteomics so you have lots of peptides and that should level out at some point but some proteins might have like only a few peptides that are actually uh, modified and what uh, which modifications you're looking for and is it like going to be absolutely uh, yes yeah. Absolutely. I, I know I completely agree. So so we 100% have to deal with that. And we do not, in here, we've not accounted for that specifically in any way, just like with proteoforms. And it 100% could be, and a lot of them likely are as well. Um, we've discussed doing searches for certain um, post-translational modifications. Uh, in the past, from what I'm aware, this is not the most sensitive uh, with the data that we have, like using the single cell data, searching for those modifications after. Some we do a very good job getting, so like acetylation and stuff like that, we can get quite well. Um, and others, for example, like phosphorylation is, yeah. you know, uh, and that's why people enrich and do so on and so forth. So um, it's certainly something we hope to try at some point and just do like these massive searches using maybe Max Quant and uh, Diane or Spectronaut, not sure yet. Um, but for now, we haven't, and I'm with you. Um, that could definitely be happening. <laughs> 